Welcome to the Atlanta VoiceOver Studio Podcast. I'm Mike Stout. And I'm Heidi Rue. The Atlanta VoiceOver Studio's mission is to equip, inspire, and elevate by giving you the resources that you need to create the voiceover career that you want. Now, this podcast features conversations with industry professionals that are geared to give you more insight into the world of voiceover. Today, we're talking about demos. Woo-hoo. Everyone is like, what, what is the demo? When do I need to do that? Why do I need it? Yada, yada, yada. We'll answer all of that. And we'll also chat with Atlanta agent Jeffrey Umberger about the agent perspective on demos. So yeah. this is a really great episode. You do not want to miss it. I think the first question, I'll let a Mike answer this, but we always get these questions, which comes first? <laughs> it's like the chicken or the egg, the demo or the training? Yeah, and there's a uh, different perspectives on this. A lot of people just go through a little bit of training, like maybe a a week or two, and then they get a demo. Our feeling is that that's not the way to go. Your demo is your calling card. It's, you know, when people ask, well, do you have a resume? Well, in the voiceover world, no, you don't. I mean, after you've been doing it for a while, there are some clients that might want, hey, what have you done in the past? But for the most part, your resume and your demo, or the resume is your demo. It's what you can do. So our answer to this question demo or training first is always going to be training. Mm -hmm. You've got to be ready to handle that demo. You've got to be able to go into the booth, be able to take direction. You've got to have your nerves, understand how to keep your nerves under control. Um, And just to to give a good product because that's going to be representing you for the longest time, Mm -hmm. or at least for a year or two, Yeah, you know, but constantly training and prepping for that time. And here we've got uh, minimums, minimum requirements that we just... Yeah, and I just want to say one more thing about the demo. So the demo is basically, a lot of people just say that the demo is reflective of how your voice sounds. Hmm. But it's not just a reflection of how your voice sounds, but it's what you can do with that. It showcases your range. Mm -hmm. It showcases your sweet spots. Mm -hmm. It showcases um, your personality and what you would probably book most. And so that is very important that you have a really good demo and that you, um, a lot of times, you know, people can direct you to to make a good sounding demo. The problem is, is that in real life VO, you're doing your auditions from home, you don't have anybody directing you, Mm -hmm. and then you get into a session, people direct you, but you got to get there fast. You can't take an hour to get the take. And so a demo showcases, all right, first of all, I can get there really quick, so I can be a professional and... um, and that, yeah, these all these things I can do, if you just ask me. I can get there really, really quick. There have been cases where we've, um, you know, some people are booked off of their demo. Mm-hmm. And if they then can't go into the session and replicate that on their own, right. that could hurt their career. Yeah. And so all that we do at Atlanta VoiceOver Studio, we always keep this in perspective of what helps your career mm-hmm. and doesn't hurt your career. Yeah. And so that is why we're so adamant, like you've got to get the training. And also the demo is a way to showcase, listen, I am ready to be a professional in this. Mm-hmm. And a professional is not made by taking one intro to voiceover class online right. or a workshop in person. That does not that's not what a professional is. So you really need to be able to be prepared and ready for that. It's it's almost akin to if you were let's say you started off in, in baseball and you were able to hit really well. You know, if you were just to take pictures of the time in practice where you're hitting home runs and that's all you showed anybody and and any scouts that came by, that's all they saw. They didn't get a chance to see how you really play. You know, all you're seeing is, is the dingers. Well, they're scouts. When they come to, to see a player, they look at their overall play. And if the rest of the play doesn't match up to those highlights, well, it doesn't work. And so the same thing with with a Mm -hmm. demo, you need to be able to hit things out of the park at the same time as doing the very basics and getting there on your own, like Heidi said. Yeah. I'm not big sports, so that analogy may not (laughs) totally. (laughs) Yeah. I I would say it was more like if you're learning how to bake a cake and I can teach you how to bake a cake right there with you and it to come out really well. But for you to do it on your own, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Let let me put it in in that kind of frame for you. (laughs) It's if you only showed pictures of the finished product. We don't know if you actually did everything leading up to that finished product. Okay. Got it. Does that work? Yeah. That works. Thank you. And so one of the things, too, that we do here at, at the Atlanta VoiceOver Studio in our classes is that we we get especially the beginner voiceover intensive we get people in the booth and we from day one we start directing them we start getting getting them used to to being able to take that direction and understanding what it takes to 
to get to these certain uh, areas so that when they are on their own, that they're able to do it. Mm -hmm. And it takes training. It takes a little bit of time. Absolutely. So you're probably now wondering, well, how do I know when I'm ready to make a demo? Because everyone is different. You can't say, okay, great. If you take this three-month course, you'll be ready after that. Yeah. There's some people that have been ready a lot sooner. There's some people that it's taken a while, a year or more, and that is okay. It does. It's not any indication of you. It's just everyone is so different. So there are certain things that we, some standards that we have set to know when you're ready for a demo. And Mm -hmm. of course, if you're training with a coach, then that coach will be able to say, yes, you are ready to make a demo. Mm -hmm. But some of the things that we um, say that is, first of all, know your range. And I don't mean like, high, low. Yeah. I, I mean, um, how are you, can you do the warm, comforting read? Can you do the millennial read? Can you mm-hmm. do the friendly, upbeat read? Can you do the more natural read? Um, you know, you need to know your range and how to get there immediately. And what is your, uh, where your strengths mm-hmm. lie? Because yeah. if, if uh, you're not talking about, uh, you know, can you do the deep, promo trailer voice. Well, my voice isn't geared toward the deep promo trailer voice. So mm-hmm. the demo wouldn't reflect that. But knowing that that's not my strength, but the friendly conversational read, uh, the warm mm-hmm. and, and uh, uh, or sexy yeah. read for some of them, mm-hmm. um, and also the cool read, you know, if you, if the, knowing that type of range is is what we're talking about right and how to get there so not only just knowing okay these are my sweet spots these are the things that I can do but also if we say okay great this is a script do that in an upbeat friendly conversational read and And, you can get there and you can get there you can get there but you can also connect Mm -hmm. with uh, a person yeah because you need to have that that connection between the listener and you Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that we, um, I, I'll let you take this one, but uh, about the the copy, three different yeah, ways. Yeah, and this is simply when we're in a... a... Share what it is. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I didn't it's, tell it's, We have it down here. It's the same line of copy, three different ways. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Hey, we're breaking down the fourth wall here. Oh, my um, gosh. And, and what we mean by that is so often when we go into um, sessions ourselves, you know, they'll have a tag. Uh, and no matter what that may be, um, I don't know, making Subway, eat fresh. Subway, eat fresh. You know, are you able to deliver that three different ways? And because sometimes we'll be in there and they'll they'll be like, okay, yeah, th- that three was pretty good, but yeah, give us another three. Mm-hmm. Okay, give us another three. You know, are you able to take that direction and just be creative with it mm-hmm. um, and not just get in your head and give the same read? back to back to back, because that's a a clear sign that you haven't been at this long. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, but you need to understand that that's one of the things that you might be asked to do. Mm-hmm. You know? The other thing, too, that um, that we ask for you to be able to do, which is d- kind of relation to that, is being able to take direction really quickly. Mm-hmm. If, um, if you book a job and a client says, okay, this is great. Now I want you to do it slightly different this way, or I want you to do it, you know, mm-hmm. um, with a little... Um, a little wink in your read or whatever, you need to be able to take that direction because mm-hmm. thing is, is if you get booked off of your audition and you get into that session and you can't take direction, again, that can hurt your career. Mm-hmm. And so, and Mike has been, and I mean, has witnessed that where yeah. he was doing um, a, a male VO for the brand and there was another female uh, VO doing that. Within doing the, I was doing the TV and she was doing radio. And yeah. within 20 minutes, right? They I got, said I had left, and I got the phone call mm-hmm. saying, "Hey, can you go back to the studio because we had to fire the other gal?" Yeah, uh, they couldn't give the read that they. Yeah, they she wanted. couldn't take direction. So all that to say, training is always necessary. Always be training. Mm-hmm. Heidi and I are always training. It mm-hmm. it's it might not be every single month, but every other month, every three months, you know, just learn from some place, move on, learn as much as you can there, move on. Um, but. The other reason with with that example, too, is that you do need to be training so that, yeah, you might be great enough to book the gig, but if you can't take that direction, mm-hmm. it's it, it'll work against you, and it'll take a, a while to, to dig out of that hole. But if you can take that direction, mm-hmm. that client is going to hire you over and over yeah. again. And when we say quickly, we don't mean uh, we don't mean that you just turn around and do it. You know, you could take a breath or two and, and oh, okay, I think you need, you mean this. Yeah, let's do this mm-hmm. with the client. And they're fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the final thing, too, and this is something that Mike kind of is a champion of. So do you want to take it? 
Uh, yes, feeling comfortable in the booth, being okay with hearing yourself in headphones. Uh, we had a demo recording um, with a student who everything that we saw, they were ready. And Brian was actually in mm-hmm. here doing that as well with us, uh, helping who, who coached this person. And we weren't getting the types of reads that we wanted out of him. And then it finally boiled down to he wasn't used to hearing himself in the headphones. <laughs> yeah. So, which I didn't even think of because, uh-huh. I mean, coming from radio, we've been listening to ourselves for so long yeah. that it's just second nature. But now when we train, we get everybody in there and make sure that they're used to hearing themselves on on the cans. Yeah. Is what they used to say. Yeah. Uh, so you need, to be, you need to be okay with feeling comfortable in the booth that if you do have nerves, and everybody has nerves at one point or another, that you know how to control that. And that you are used to hearing yourself in your headphones and that you can work. You can just do what you're there to do. Yeah. So if you are getting to that point where you're ready for a demo, what do you look for in a place that does demos? I mean, first and foremost, listen to some of their final products. You can hear yeah. our finished products on our website under the demo yeah, section. Yeah, we've got a few up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we can send you a bunch more, too, if you're like, you know, um, I'm kind of younger, um, you know, do you have, have you done any demos for younger people or whatever, then we can send you those type things. And then the other thing too is, do they write scripts or do they ask you to provide the scripts? Mm -hmm. Now, um, our philosophy is, is that we write the scripts for the talent. Mm -hmm. And there's several reasons why. Um, It it does honestly add some more costs that we write them, of course. But here's the thing is if you're bringing in your own scripts, we don't feel like you're objective enough coming from your We're not objective enough to write our own scripts. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And if you're a beginner, too, you really don't know what what ad agencies are looking for, what the trends are right now, what agencies are looking for, Mm -hmm. what the buzzwords are, things like that. And so it it could hinder your final production, uh, Mm -hmm. demo production. Um, But the other reason why we love to write scripts is because we can customize it for you. Nobody else is going to have that same demo. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that we can do to really showcase not only your range, but your personality and your essence. Yeah, tell them about the the one we did for the... For Scott, who talked. Yeah, so we had um, we had a, a a student Scott who was is is phenomenal, and um, he did his demo and he said, "Oh yeah, by the way, I can read backwards." Wait, and I was what? like, "What? <laughs> you can read backwards? Are you kidding me?" Okay, we have got to put that in the demo, and so I created this Red Bull spot for him using that talent that he had. Yeah, and he literally almost booked this job right after we produced the demo because of that. So not everybody's going to be able to talk backwards, obviously, but there's some uniqueness to everybody that is what you bring to the table. And so we really like to be able to showcase that by writing scripts specifically for you. Yeah. So, yeah. And the other thing with with demos, too, we want to say we're not the only game in town. Yeah. You know, do your due, due diligence. Talk to other people. Check out everything about it and then pick the the place that that works best for you and your budget Mm -hmm. uh this is just these are our requirements because we hold ourselves and this company to a higher standard Mm -hmm. so that's the the bottom line with that yeah and make sure when you're listening to other demos to the production value is Mm -hmm. there listen if you hear a demo and you know that if you've done any work in like iMovie or anything like that you know there's (laughs) some like canned uh freebie songs there if they're using those i would say probably not go with that production company. Yeah, you want you know? it to stand out and not... Because when somebody hears that demo, if they've heard the the canned music that's been used before, yeah. they're gonna it's going to take them totally out of listening to you. Yeah. Where have I heard that, that music before? Mm-hmm. Oh, let me listen to this person, you know. Yeah, or even so. they're like, oh... So they may have made it with a friend or right. at home. Which typically it's it's usually evident. Mm-hmm. I've only yeah. heard one that was even decent enough to be, wow, okay, yeah. you did that on your own. Mm-hmm. You're pretty talented. Yeah. And then also, what are the requirements from that person that's doing the demo? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do they just say, okay, great, come on in, show, you know, read a couple things for me and you're good to go? Um you know, do they just want you to say, okay, after you've done five classes or one day workshop, then we'll create a demo for you. Um, Again, more than likely, like what we said, you really need to have that training and you need to be able to do certain things before you create a demo. Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, let's talk a little bit about kind of the demos that we sh- we do, mm-hmm. um, the pricing and the breakdown, and then what we offer after that too. Yeah, so we are not the cheapest, and we're not the most expensive. Heidi has spent twenty four hundred dollars on a mm-hmm. uh, a demo. That was your promo demo. Yeah, uh, one that we went eighteen hundred is what our coach mm-hmm. charged uh, for doing demos here at the studio. At this point in time, we charge a thousand. Um, and that's to take care of a our time because you get both of us mm-hmm. uh, when we're here recording. Um, also takes care of writing the scripts for you, um, and that takes a lot of time. Uh, and then production, mm-hmm. uh, production value. We've got a great engineer who puts it all together and makes it sound competitive for what the market is needing. And the the other good part about that is that again, we know the trends. We pay attention to the trends because we are working voiceover talent. And so we have so many contacts, um, either from uh, things that just we've learned or things that come down that thing, uh, that our mentors will pass along uh, that we include in all this. So we know what's going on in the industry. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, you kind of get a little bit of knowledge yourself about what's going on. Yeah. Just so you know, that ringing in the background, that was our next star session. Next so quiet. we got to hurry this up. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the other thing, too, that I wanted to say is that we provide with our demos is we provide a PDF of next steps. So once you get that demo, what do you do there? So we provide a list of some of the local Atlanta agents, their mm-hmm. submission requirements, and then also beyond agents, what are some other options that you could do to start auditioning for jobs? And then we give you some tips, too, both on the online casting sites and then how to submit to agents. Yeah, because we get a lot of questions about it. And a lot of people who come to us for demos are, are just starting out, and so they don't have any idea about how to submit. So it's mm-hmm. just one more way that we can help serve you and and uh just give you a leg up with what to do now. Yeah. And we also do do partial demos. So if you have a demo that you're like, you know, I kind of want to tweak it or Mm -hmm. it's been a while and you think, well, some of the stuff is probably good, but maybe I need Mm -hmm. to add a couple of scripts or whatever. We do offer partial demos and you can always email us at admin at Atlanta voiceover studio.com and we'll give you the breakdown of that. And the demos that we do here are commercial industrial narration. Mm -hmm. Uh, And IVR too. And IVR. Yeah. Uh, And if you want animation, we've got a gal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> Who I'm coaching with, mm-hmm. so. Yep, and uh, she's awesome. Yeah. Great. Okay, and one last thing before we kind of wrap it up, but um, how often do we need to update the demo? Yeah, that's, that's the big question. <laughs> okay, you want me can... to answer that? <laughs> I'm, yeah, I want to see what you say on this one. Oh, okay. I think it depends. I don't think you can put <clears throat> in. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have that taboo buzzer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd rather a shot collar. That'd be fun. Oh, this is great. <laughs> um, next podcast, we'll do marriage tips. <laughs> How to stay happy in a marriage shot collar <laughs> for your spouse. <laughs> Um, how often to update your demo? It really does depend. I would not put a specific time limit on it um, because it depends on the trends, what's going mm-hmm. on. If you're, um, if if a lot has happened over the past couple of years and your demo kind of sounds a little old school, like most of those spots, or it's just been, it's. Um, they create them and produce them a lot differently now, then mm. I would say definitely update your demo. If your voice has changed, if, your if you're a kid. Um, also, if you've booked some things, I mean, you can always take what you've booked and put yeah. those into a demo to showcase uh, what you have. And if you don't have enough to, to round out a full demo, then we can write uh, the mm-hmm. rest of those to, to fill it out. But yeah, it depends. I mean, one to two years. I'm going on uh, my second year for my mm-hmm. demo. Yeah. Uh, and that'll, that'll suit me for... I think another few months. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll have to do it. But yeah, if there and are... I would al- I would also say, too, that if you start to book a certain spec that may have not been up front on your demo. Um, so like for me, what we did is we changed the first spot to be a little bit more natural, slightly mm-hmm. millennial sounding, because that's what I was starting to book more. And that's, and what that's people, where the trends were. That's where going. the trends are. So we need to put that front and center. Mm-hmm. So that would be the other thing, too. I like your demo. Thank you. <laughs> That's so sweet. <laughs> Makes up for the shot collar Great. comment. <laughs> okay, so it, listen, again, we're not the only place that does demos, but we wanted to provide kind of a really good informational um, podcast so that that way you can um, you can find out more information because a lot of people ask us about demos. Yeah. Um, if you did want to choose us to do your demo, then you would just email um, 
myself, Heidi, at AtlantaVoiceOverStudio.com. Um, most of the time we do have a little bit of a waiting list, so I would suggest getting on the queue. But um, if you haven't done classes with us, then you, we would send you some scripts to audition. Just make sure that you can do all those things that we ask. Yeah, and again, we have these requirements because this is a big investment, and we don't want you just wasting money and only being able to use it for weeks to a few months to mm-hmm. maybe a half a year. Um, and it's it's voiceover is a is a threshold. I mean, there's a there's a a threshold bar to get in, and it's a it can be a big investment, but it's worth it to showcase everything that you can do mm-hmm. and to know that you're ready to do that demo. It just it bolsters you. You yeah. know, yes, I can do this. And that's partly why we're here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we don't want to just it to come from us. We wanted to have an agent perspective. So mm-hmm. we're so happy to have Jeffrey Umberger here. And um, he's going to share from an agent perspective, um, you know, some of the standards for demos and what he looks for. So we're excited to hear from him. Jeffrey, I just want to um, start by kind of introducing you to anybody that doesn't happen to know you, but you're a very prominent agent here in Atlanta um, and known throughout uh, the nation, as well as an agent. Can you share a little bit just about like how long you've been an agent? Yeah, I was um, an actor first uh, through the 80s and 90s, and then um, began uh, um, working as a photographer, and that led to working in casting. And then that uh, led to working at People Store as an agent. And um, I started there in 2005 in the VO booth, and the front office and uh, eventually uh, obtained the print department and I headed that up for a while then. Rita Harrell was the uh, BO agent there and she had her first child and left and so I took over the voiceover department as well and um, uh, I believe that was 2007 or something around there I'm supposed to say. <laughs> but it's, bad, it's been about 14 years I guess. You know, um, the casting before that um, it's just sort of another perspective or another side of agency. So I would have to say the whole behind the scenes or agent type work would date back uh, to 2003, so maybe 16 years or so. So around that area. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. Great. Well, th- we just kind of want to check in with you on just a couple of things regarding demos, because that's kind of what we're talking about on the episode today. Um, but one of the things that I want to start off with is what do agents wish that talent knew about demos? I suppose um, first having your demo shot or, or I guess um, auditioned, so to speak, with many different types of ears. So the, the demo producer, of course, has a great um, key into what um, talent need on their demo, and it does help talent to have someone such as yourself be so fluent with what needs to be on a demo um, or suggestions or styles. And so they need to pay attention definitely to their producer and then shop that demo before maybe presenting it to uh, anyone that might need it for considering on a roster or a job or whatever it might be. Run it by people that you know that are not in the business and say, what part of this doesn't sound like me? Um, You know me well. You hear me talk all the time. Does any of this sound put on? Or just have them get outside forces to give opinions. And then anyone that all that they know that will listen to a demo to get feedback is very important. Um, At that point, what is on the demo, um, it needs to be, I mean, it can be as long as it needs to be, but typically... Uh, ears on demos will only last four to seven seconds before the checks have already been made for, not the checks, the boxes have already been checked whether they love the demo or just don't need that talent sound at the moment or they don't like the demo. So sometimes if your best stuff is not at the top, in that that sort of um, range of four to seven seconds, which is a shelf life for attention span and time schedules to listen to demos, um, then you might have missed it. Um, and, of course, someone's opinion on what your best foot forward is will change according to all those listening years that you had listened to your demo. So it's a bit of a uh, catch-22. You don't quite know when you really, really have it right. But it, I think at certain points you'll realize, well, if I move this one up to the front, I seem to get more positive feedback. So you need to have many trial runs of your demo before you've maybe got it set in stone. And then when you're with an agent, you're going to have 
uh, you know, I specifically rearrange demos according to my buyer's uh, urges or desires or needs at the time. Mm -hmm. And so it's retrofitted per agency, too. So your demo, while being complete, might be swapped, you know, um, pay, uh, uh, place, placement-wise as things go on or as trends change or as you get new material, you know. Yeah, that's... <clears throat> I mean, that, that's totally true, and I know that's happened for us before, you know, where agents have swapped things around because of what they needed specifically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'd say one warning sign, Heidi and Mike, is that for demos, um, you know, it is in my, my estimate, estimation that once I get a demo, I kind of assume that it's demo material. I don't always naturally assume that it's work that, that you've procured that you've actually booked before. I don't know why that belief is suspended, but I, you know, so many people um, are in the, the the throes of having a demo produced, and a lot of times that does mean doing scripts that you've either had written for you, which I know you do expertly when you do demos, um, and that's a talent all its own, or that you know I've heard demos from people um, doing material on their demo that I actually booked my talent on for that for that same client. So I know automatically that they didn't, so it's just demo material. There's nothing wrong with demo material versus actual material at all. Um, it's very nice to know when it is real material because that can that can indicate to the uh, agent when a talent is uh, live with a conflict now or at least to be talked about if it's health insurance or health field. We need to know if your Northside Hospital spot is actually real material like it's demo material and, and if it's live conflict but um also the uh i guess the other part of that is that some people will make a, a demo and make it be um a clever thread a threaded demo where, where mm -hmm. the first spot um speaks uh, coincidentally to the next spot and then you have a through line by the end you've kind of told a little story i guess or <laughs> a scenario and that is a real dead giveaway that that's just real demo stuff, and it's kind of a clever, it's clever, but it's not uh, handy at all for an agent. After you're finished listening to that, I think you're, you're feeling like this talent might not have any real experience at all. Hmm. So you have to suspend the belief. At the same time, you have to know that people probably know that it's all demo material and will be pleasantly surprised to hear that a lot of it is actually you know, procured booked material. So just to clarify then, it uh, you would advocate someone who is submitting to you to let you know that, hey, this is just a spec demo that I did just to show you what I'm capable of, uh, or this is a mix of both stuff that I've booked as well as spec stuff. Is that right? Um, I think that can't hurt to clarify. Okay. Um, the real issue would be if you do have something on your demo that you know is a current conflict, just let the, um, let the agent know that that is current conflict. And the rest of them could be actually procured booked material. But they're no longer in conflict. They, they've outlived their shelf life or they're not on the air. So they're not anything you need to talk about anyway. So you're not okay. actually spending any time um, speci specifying which ones are or not, only the ones that are actually going to be a conflict that the agent needs to know about. Right. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so since you are an agent, and I, I just have to say this, uh, Jeffrey, Another agent uh, here in town, Richard Hutchison, who mm -hmm. was a staple here in Atlanta <laughs> for so yeah. long, uh, he gave uh, such a great compliment. We were talking one day, and he, he just said, you know, Jeffrey's always had such a great ear for talent. Um, and I just thought that was that was pretty cool wow. to hear. That's quite a compliment coming from another a peer. You know, that's so nice to hear. And you don't get fed compliments like that, although I do know that Richard was always very, is always very complimentary, and we got along together so well and that's a nice mark of the professionalism in our town in our industry absolutely absolutely well, uh, i appreciate you sharing that yeah and i can't believe that i didn't tell you that uh off air <laughs> 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 nothing like a podcast to just get that out in the open right <laughs> i was saving it up for a good time <laughs> well that was it this is a good time <laughs> <laughs> well since um since we are on the topics of uh a topic of uh demos and whatnot Explain any tips that you might have outside of what you've already shared uh, of submitting to agents. How I like to be approached. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> outside the of the $5 bills. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, um, no payola or anything. Um, right. I 
I have on my website, and most agencies will, for the sake of their own sanity plus the clarity for the talent submitting, is is my particular um, guidelines for submission um, submitting demos. And so, I have a specific uh, email that's just for submission. So number one, they won't fill up the inbox for um, day to day bookings, and they won't you know fill the storage. And then I can know I can go to one place and search anything I need to and keep track of them much better there. So that's one thing that I, I do want to bring to people's attention is the agency has a website. Usually they will specify how they want to be submitted to over anybody else. Um, and so definitely keep, even if you checked my website three months ago, then had your demo made, and then just uh, you need to check back because maybe my system might have changed um, as it often needs to. So, mm -hmm. And also I may not be may not be um, accepting submissions. And, mm -hmm. you know, I do want to say that if that has been stated on a website, don't um, don't submit then because what it does, it puts me in a tough space. I don't like to say no, and I don't like to have to say, well, I'm not, I'm not submit, uh, accepting right now. You know, I'm trying to keep my roster a little tighter, mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm bringing on talent, especially talent that are referred or that uh, I might not have, have holes in the roster from, or trends as they change, I need more of, you know. So, um, but really listen to the guidelines and, and pay attention to them and know where to send your materials and and, and, it, and pay attention to who you're submitting to. Um, sometimes I'll get a, a blank, what do you call it, a, a group. Submission. Oh, gosh. Oh, man. Yeah, so it's, it's kind to of To whom it may to, concern. To whom it may concern, <laughs> yeah. And dear sir or madam or other. Right. And then so... Uh, that's a, that's a no no because it means that you didn't you, you might have checked out who you're submitting to but you've you've gone to no trouble to personalize it and mm -hmm. um, and it's just not a great feeling there but really just if you are submitting to keep clean um, not to write a book about it mm -hmm. and just say I would love uh, your consideration I've checked out your website I don't hear anyone that seems to be in my particular category if I do I don't hear as many so maybe you have room. And um, and then on my website under the submission guides also say if you don't hear back, resubmit six months. You know, mm -hmm. um, and then just resubmit again. It's not no. It just wasn't yes at the time. And so uh, I would think that would pretty much take care of it. I I think it's okay to put a link in your in your in your demo uh, submission as well. It, it helped me to find where you are socially. You know, either on social scene or what your website's like, and there's info about you on your website I can go to to find out rather than having to read it in an email, and I might not have that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think that's, that's pretty much an A and B, you know, make it concise and, and, you know, and, and follow the guidelines per agency. And then speaking of that social note that I, I put in there, I think you should be on uh, social with your business and your personal, maybe keep them separate. I, and I think you do that, Mike and Heidi both, mm -hmm. I believe. But I do check people out social, socially wise. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very quick way to at least uh, superficially vet people and make sure. You know, I've, I've done searches when I've had submissions. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually, you know, before so much social was available, I did Google search and I've. You know, one person's um, mugshot showed up. And not oh. that it was bad, but <laughs> I mean, it was not a bad um, demeanor you know, or anything. <laughs> it, it wasn't a horrible uh, arrest or anything. I guess all arrests might be horrible, but I mean, it was not, was not something that I thought, oh, well, never, never at all. But um, it was alarming to see a, a mugshot be the first shot that showed up under the person, you know. Um, and uh, so, I do think. You need to keep your um, your social stuff up to date. Always mention when you're studying. Always mention that you volunteered and here's what I did for this company. You know, in hopes that they would sign me on for their voice or whatever it is. Let people know that you're studying and let people hear your demo and give you feedback. And that um, that keeps your presence alive. You know, I I came at a time in my own business when. Um, I had left um, one agency and not planned on opening my own place, but then later decided to. So I needed to um, uh, be present without going uh, sort of, since I was still in the same community, I didn't want to go against anyone else's agency and, and, and uh, poach or reintroduce 
some contacts I had made at the other agency. And so mm -hmm. I had to say, just, I had to say, I'm doing this. And all that found me, found me. Mm -hmm. But that was through social media. And at the time, I mean, I certainly couldn't afford advertising. And there's not too much advertising an agency can do anyway. So um, rather than going to production houses that I once worked with, I just let whoever was needing voiceover hear about there being an option and uh, let the chips fall where they may live with me going back and finding them and saying, hey, over here. I felt that was the only fair and ethical. So I owe my business um, I, you know, to social media. I mean, that's totally how I built it in the beginning days. Now, of course, I, 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 I fan that out and I, I reach out to um, producers um, and uh, am present at conferences and things like that as an advocate advocate and so I think it all sort of pools into one big bowl now for me but that's how I started off so if you think your social is not important you're you might be missing a beat so keep mm -hmm. it keep yeah. it up to date one last question too about um, submitting to agents Jeffrey subject line is there kind of a good format for what to include in the subject line more than just like Hey, I want to be on your roster. Yeah, does, does hey, you work? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that could work. Or you have uh, hey, you work. Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, but the ones that actually catch my eye are they catch for the right reason. In that you could be a commodity and have a dual language that you speak, or mm. you know, um, multilingual. That certainly is something that I need to to see quickly um, because those are those are needs over and above whether I have holes in my roster or not. That always is always something that one needs to sort of look at. So in the subject line it needs to say um, European talent submitting stateside or multilingual or um, bipolar. <laughs> we know it all. <laughs> and multilingual does not include English and Southern English. Right. That's right. <laughs> that would not include those automatically, anyway. <laughs> um, but otherwise, it, it doesn't get my attention or not get my attention anymore. I know if I'm getting emails in that one email, specifically speaking of my submission process, I know if I'm getting an email there, that's going to be a submission. So I don't really pay too much attention to what's in the uh, subject line unless it grabs my attention by saying um, a Russian uh, actor. You know, that was, that was very recent. And it's, you know, I had I had a need for a Russian actor, and I knew of one, and I was able to fill that person's, um, at least gave that person, that, that buyer, an option. Nice. So, it's, you know, that was nice to see that I had that in my inbox. I could go back and <laughs> track that down. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for taking time to share with us. Um, we just really appreciate it, and, uh, you know, we really just adore you. So uh, thank you so much again. Well, Thank you, Heike and Mighty. I adore you both back. And, uh, <laughs> we love you, John Bray. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and um, thank you for what you're doing to help the community. This is a, a huge you know, service that you do and with such great flair and you know, creativity and personality. So love you back. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Thanks, we Jeffrey. appreciate it. Hope you have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. We'll see you soon. Okay, <laughs> bye. Bye, thanks. Thank you for joining us today as we navigate the world of voiceover and strive to elevate what we can offer as voice talent. And if you enjoyed this episode, sign up for our email newsletter where we'll send you a juicy VO tip every Monday morning. So you can find the link for that in the description below. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode that could benefit your career. We hope you feel inspired to move one step closer to your goal. 